Book Summary of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen R. Covey Hello friends. Welcome to Bhagirath Audio Hub. I am Akash. I wish to you well. Let's start book summary. Introduction. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Infographics edition by Stephen R. Covey is the 2016 edition of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Powerful Lessons in Personal Change which was first published in 1989. The infographics edition employs the use of infographics format to make the message easier to understand. The format is highly readable and it communicates the same timeless message that Covey incorporated in the Seven Habits book years ago. The book consists of four parts. Part 1 is Paradigms and Principles and consists of two chapters inside out and the seven habits and overview part 2 is private victory and consist of the first three habits be proactive begin with the end in mind and put first things first part 3 is public victory and included four chapters paradigms of interdependence and habits 4 5 and 6 think win win seek first to understand then to be understood and synergize Part 4 is renewal and consist of the seventh habit sharpen the saw principles of balanced self renewal the last chapter of part 4 is inside out again part 1 of the seven habits of highly effective people powerful lessons in personal change chapter 1 of the seven habits of highly effective people powerful lessons in personal change inside out In this chapter, Covey delves into the concept of character ethic and personality ethic. Using a personal parenting example, Covey highlights that a change in perception is important if people are to achieve some of the goals they set out. He studied success literature going back 200 years and discovered a pattern within the literature content. In the first 150 years, the literature was focused on a character ethic While in the last 50 years the literature was filled with personality ethic. He explains that character ethic taught the basic principles of effective living, while personality ethic taught that success was a function of personality, public image, as well as skills that improved human interaction. He expresses that his use of personality ethic to try and change his son was flawed and that the use of character ethic helped him and his wife Sandra to finally allow their child to be who he wanted to be. This brought about the desired change. Covey outlines the concept of primary and secondary greatness. Secondary greatness is a product of personality ethics and while it is important, it fails when it is not held up by the character ethic which forms the foundation. Secondary greatness is short-lived since it is founded on personality ethic which wears out. Covey outlines the power of a paradigm. Paradigms are maps and having the right map is fundamental if we are to reach the right destination. He uses an image exercise to express how two opinions can be right and that an open mind is required if we are to understand other people's perceptions. He explains that there are facts even though experiences may be unique. He outlines the power of a paradigm shift which he describes as the aha experience when someone gets the other person's image in the exercise paradigm shifts may be positive or negative but they create a powerful change quantum improvements in our lives can only be achieved once we decide to work on our paradigms which influence our attitudes and behaviors He explains that not all paradigm shifts are instantaneous but that they are inseparable from character. The principle centered paradigm is likened to the lighthouse. Covey explains that principles are natural laws that cannot be changed and that they are woven into the fabric of every civilized society. He provides examples of principles and insists that principles are not values. Principles are fundamental and have permanent value. He explains that the more our paradigms are closely aligned with the principles, the more accurate the map will be. He explains that personality ethic is illusory and deceptive, 
and that appeals to the masses because it promises a quick fix. He explains that this is not how life works, since development and growth have sequential stages, and none of the stages can be skipped. He continues by stating, through various examples, that trying to take a shortcut results in disappointment and frustration. He outlines that a journey of a thousand steps starts with one step, one step at a time. Covey states that the way we see a problem is a problem. He explains that personality ethic calls for a quick fix when what is needed is to see the deeper part of the issue. He explains that personality ethic influences how we view the problem, as well as how we attempt to solve it. He explains that the inside-out approach is a process that starts with private victories and then moves on to public victories. The process leads to an upward spiral of growth that leads to progressively higher forms of responsible independence and effective interdependence. Are you enjoying the book so far? Or, you can choose to leave one later. Chapter 2 Of the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People Powerful Lessons in Personal Change The 7 Habits An Overview Covey expresses that habits can be learned and unlearned, and they do have a tremendous pull on us which is why we find it hard to break certain habits. He explains that gravity can work with us or against us. He defines a habit as an intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. Working on knowledge, skill, and desire can help us break through to new levels of personal and interpersonal effectiveness by breaking old paradigms. The seven habits work in harmony with the natural laws and move us progressively on a maturity continuum from dependence to independence and interdependence. He explains the concepts of dependence, independence, and interdependence, and the consequence of the same. Habits 1, 2, and 3 are geared towards self-mastery, and this is designed to help in the achievement of true independence and to break from dependence. He describes these habits as private victories. True independence is the foundation of effective interdependence, which is explained through habits 4, 5, and 6. These are described as the public victories and are geared toward teamwork, cooperation, and communication. Habit 7 encircles and embodies all the other 6 habits and consists of the regular, balanced renewal of the four basic dimensions of life. Covey explains that the seven habits are habits of effectiveness. They are based on the P-PC balance, a paradigm of effectiveness. He uses the Aesop fable of the goose and the golden egg to explain the P-PC balance. P stands for production, and PC stands for production capability. He uses various examples to explain the importance of the P-PC balance, including marriage and parenting. He provides the role of P-PC in the organization, coupled with examples to explain the importance of balancing production and production capability. He explains that P-PC is the very essence of effectiveness and that it is the lighthouse upon which the seven habits are based. He advises the reader on how to approach the book, including employing a paradigm shift to benefit from the teachings outlined. He asserts that the book is not a quick fix, but there will be immediate results that are aimed at encouraging the reader to employ habits. Part 2 of the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People Powerful lessons in personal change private victory consist of the first three habits, be proactive, begin with the end in mind, and put first things first. Chapter 3 Of the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People Powerful Lessons in Personal Change Habit 1 Be Proactive In this chapter, Kavi reiterates the concept that humans have self-awareness, which separates us from animals. He expresses that this self-awareness allows us to examine our most fundamental paradigm, the self-paradigm. This view of ourselves can be principle-based, or a function of conditioning and conditions. The social mirror is the vision of ourselves from the perception of others. He considers these societal visions as a reflection of the projections others place on us. 
he outlines three social paradigms, or maps, which include genetic determinism, psychic determinism, and environmental determinism. These paradigms are based on Pavlov's experiments, and Covey questions their accuracy and functionality in our lives. Using the story of Viktor Frankl, he introduces the concept of between stimulus and response. He expresses that within the human ability to choose, are endowments that make humans unique. Even the most intelligent animals operate on instinct or training but have none of the endowments humans enjoy. The freedom of choice lies between the stimulus and the response, and it is our greatest power. Proactivity is defined as more than just taking initiative, it includes taking responsibility for our own lives. He explains responsibility as responsibility, defined as the ability to choose your response. Humans are proactive, although, through the condition, we consciously or by default, become reactive. Reactive people are driven by feelings, circumstances, conditions, or the environment. Proactive people, on the other hand, are driven by carefully selected and internalized values. He provides various examples to describe how he, Sandra, and other individuals decided to become proactive. He outlines Frankl's three central values, the experiential, creative, and attitudinal. He states that the attitudinal value is the highest among the three and that it creates a paradigm shift. This leads to a larger perspective that reflects the attitudinal values that are inspirational to all. He explains that taking initiative is not being pushy, aggressive, or obnoxious. Rather, it is recognizing our abilities to make things happen. Many people wait for something to happen or someone to take care of them. However, proactive people end up with good jobs because they are solutions to problems, and not the problems themselves. Proactivity is part of human nature, although it lies dormant in some people. He states that there is a 5000 plus percent difference between those who take initiative and those who don't. He explains that initiative is required to develop the seven habits and that if we wait it acts, we will be acted upon. He provides an organizational example of how companies became proactive. Language is a real indicator of the degree that we view ourselves as proactive people. Reactive language becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. However, proactive people put values first. He introduces the concepts of the circle of concern and the circle of influence. The circle of concerns refers to the things we have no control over while the circle of influence includes the things that we can do something about. Proactive people invest time and energy in the circle of influence, while reactive people are consumed by their circle of concern. Additionally, proactive people work on changing from the inside out. Making and keeping commitments is present in the circle of influence. Our integrity in keeping these promises is a clear manifestation of our proactivity. He advises the reader to take a 30-day test to develop proactivity. In the 30 days, the focus should be on the circle of influence. The focus should be on working on the things that we have control over. Knowing that we are responsible is fundamental to our effectiveness, even when it comes to the other habits of effectiveness. Chapter 4. Habit 2. Begin with the end in mind. Covey starts by asking the reader to imagine his or her funeral, and imagine what will be said about him or her. This exercise, he explains, will greatly increase the reader's understanding of the second habit. Beginning with the end in mind involves examining behavior in the context of the whole, focusing on what matters to you. He highlights those who have achieved empty success. Beginning with the end in mind helps in gaining a different perspective. Beginning with the end in mind is based on the principle that all things are created twice, the mental and physical creation. He calls these the first and second creations respectively. He expresses that by taking responsibility for the two creations, we focus on our circle of influence and enlarge it. 
Refusing to take responsibility for the first creation diminishes our circle of influence. However, not all first creations are conscious by design, and yet there is the first creation for everything. Beginning with the end in mind means that we are responsible for our first creation and that we need to re-script our paradigms so that they match the values and correct principles. With these values in mind, we don't have to react to everything, and we can be truly proactive. A mission statement, according to Covey, can be called a personal constitution. It is based on the correct principles, the basis for making major, life-directing decisions. He explains that a mission statement helps us flow with changes and that this wouldn't be possible if we had no changeless core. The essence of your proactivity is based on a sense of mission. To write a personal mission statement, we have to start at the center of our circle of influence, where values and visions are. Imagination is key in creating the end we desire, and this gives us a sense of direction and purpose. The center of our circle of influence contains four factors, security, guidance, wisdom, and power, which are interdependent. However, there exist alternative centers in us, although we may not recognize them. These may include spouse-centeredness, family-centeredness, money-centeredness, work-centeredness, possession-centeredness, pleasure-centeredness, friend, enemy-centeredness, church-centeredness, and self-centeredness. Spouse-centered people derive their sense of emotional worth from the marriage and become highly dependent on that relationship. Family-centered people get their sense of security and personal worth from fam-ily traditions and culture and become vulnerable to any changes that may occur. Money-centered people put aside any other priorities, including family, and assume that others understand the economic demands take precedence. Work-centered people become workaholics, and they derive their fundamental identity from their profession. Possession-centered people are always looking to accumulate tangible and non-tangible possessions, and their sense of security is based on reputation and possessions. Pleasure-centered people are always in search of pleasure and fun, and they are always looking for more exciting things to do, to get a bigger, high. Friend, enemy-centered people exclusively focus on a single person, either through their friendship or hostility. They focus on fitting into a certain group or trying to outdo a particular person. Church-centered people are intensely involved in church activities. Covey outlines that being active in the church does not necessarily mean that a person is spiritual. These individuals are usually so engrossed in church activities that they become insensitive to the needs of others. They end up violating the beliefs that they claim to uphold. Self-centeredness, Covey explains, is the most obvious form of selfishness. There is little wisdom, security, guidance, or power in self-centeredness. By looking at our life support factors, we can determine which one is the center of our own lives. However, we may fluctuate from one to another. The ideal is to create a clear center from where we can consistently derive a high degree of the four factors to empower our proactivity. Centering our lives on the correct principles creates a solid foundation for the development of the four factors. Principles are bigger than circumstances, and they have been triumphant time and time again throughout centuries. He provides various examples showcasing decisions based on alternative centers. He states that a principle-centered person will be able to see things differently, and therefore act differently. When it comes to writing our statements, Frankel expresses that we detect them, rather than invent them. Our meaning comes from within. This, therefore, means that creating a personal mission statement requires deep introspection, careful analysis, thoughtful expression, and several rewrites to produce the final statement. The mission statement will be regularly reviewed and updated. Writing a mission statement may be made easier by first identifying your roles in life as well as your goals. This helps to give your life more harmony and balance.
Mission statements are not limited to individuals. You can create family or organizational mission statements. He uses examples to outline how to create an effective family and organizational mission statements. He concludes the chapter by outlining six suggestions on how to create personal, family, and organizational mission statements. Chapter 5. Habit 3. Put first things first. The chapter starts with an exercise, with the answers to be revisited later. Covey explains that habits 1 and 2 are essential and a prerequisite to habit 3. The human will makes independent self-management possible. The degree of our will is measured by our integrity. He explains that management and leadership are fundamentally different, mainly because leadership is a high-powered, right-brain activity. Management involves the breaking down, the analysis, the specific application, and the time-bound left-brain aspect self-government. He highlights his maxim, manage from the left, lead from the right. Covey expresses that the book The Common Denominator of Success by E. M. Gray that successful people shared one principle, putting first things first. The strength of the successful people's purpose drives them to do even the things they do not like. This ability of successful people being able to subordinate to the strength of their purpose requires a mission. This is a habit too clear sense of direction that ignites a burning, yes, in the individual that allows him or her to say, no, to the things that do not benefit the mission. However, this requires an independent will. This is the power to be a function of the values rather than a function of impulses and desire. This allows you to be able to do the things you do not want to. Covey outlines the four generations of time management, with the fourth generation being the most effective. In the four quadrants, proactivity means that you work on quadrant two. To spend time working on quadrant two activities, one has to learn to say no. He gives personal examples outlining the importance of using the word no. To become a Quadrant 2 self-manager, you have to participate in four fundamental activities, identifying roles, selecting goals, scheduling, and daily adapting. However, there are times when the schedule cannot be followed out as planned. The principal-centered person can do this with ease. He provides a personal example to highlight instances when scheduling is affected. Principle-centeredness allows us to be flexible and adapt to scheduling changes. The tools of fourth-generation management allow for spontaneity, which was lacking in the previous three generations. Delegation is a way of making P and PC effective. However, Goffer delegation is ineffective and may greatly affect PC because it is focused on methods. Stewardship delegation, on the other hand, is focused on results. Stewardship delegation involves clear communication and upfront mutual agreement, understanding, and expectations in five factors, desired results, guidelines, resources, accountability, and consequences. He outlines a personal example involving his use of stewardship delegation and the success he achieved. Covey states that effective delegation may be the greatest indicator of effective management. Quadrant 2 embodies the seven habits. Dealing with fundamentally important things on a regular basis is bound to make a tremendous positive difference in our lives. He concluded the chapter by outlining suggestions to help in employing fourth-generation self-management. Are you enjoying the book so far? Or, you can choose to leave one later. Part 3 of the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People Powerful Lessons in Personal Change Public Victory includes 4 chapters, Paradigms of Interdependence and Habits 4, 5, and 6, Think Win, Win, Seek First to Understand, Then to Be Understood, and Synergize. Chapter 6 Paradigms of Interdependence Covey begins by reiterating that private victory precedes public victory and that effective interdependence can only be built on a foundation of true independence. 
He provides an example to explain the need for a paradigm shift to find solutions to existing problems. In essence, self-mastery and self-discipline are the foundations of good relationships with others. He explains that if our words and actions are based on personality ethic as opposed to character ethic, the duplicity will be evident, and we won't be able to create the foundation necessary for effective interdependence. As we become independent, through proactivity and principle-centeredness, we are then able to choose to be interdependent. The P-PC balance is needed to be able to effectively mend relationships and sustain existing ones. The quick fixes of personality ethic rarely last, and they only work to obscure the pain felt by the parties. Kavi introduces the concept of the emotional bank account. This is a metaphor explaining the amount of trust built up in a relationship. When deposits are made into the emotional bank account, through kindness, honesty, and integrity, a reserve is built up. This means that one can make mistakes, and the reserve will compensate for it. However, if one has a habit of disrespecting, cutting off, overreacting, or blaming the other person, only withdrawals are made, and soon enough, the emotional bank account is withdrawn. The trust level is low, and there is no flexibility in the relationship. It essentially becomes a minefield. The large reserve of trust has to be maintained through frequent deposits, and our most constant relationships require constant deposits. However, it is worth noting that building and maintaining relationships are long-term investments. Kavi suggests six major deposits that build up the emotional bank account. They include, understanding the individual, attending to the little things, keeping commitments, clarifying expectations, showing personal integrity, and the laws of love and the laws of life. He provides examples of making each of the deposits as it applies to family or organizations. In an interdependent situation, every P problem is a PC opportunity. This is a chance to build upon the emotional bank account. The P, PC balance is necessary for effectiveness to be present in an interdependent reality. For this reason, we can value our problems as opportunities to increase PC. Chapter 7. Habit 4, Think Win, Win. Kavi begins by giving the story of a manager with a performance issue in his company. This example is used to highlight the importance of thinking win-win if you are to influence other people. He explains that win-win is not a strategy, but rather, it is one of the six paradigms of interactions. The six paradigms are, win, 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 lose, lose, win, lose, lose, win, win, win or no deal. Win, win is a frame of heart that seeks mutual benefit in all human interactions. In win-lose, the authoritarian approach is used. One person uses their position, power, credentials, possessions, or personality to get their way. In lose-win, one person is quick to please or appease. They give in or give up, letting the other person have the advantage. Win, lose people love to lose-win people because they get to take advantage of the other person's weaknesses. Lose, lose is when two people are determined, stubborn, and ego invested. This is a classic result when two win-lose people get together. They may become vindictive, forgetting that revenge is a double-edged sword. The winning mentality is when a person doesn't care whether the other party wins or loses. As long as he or she wins, everything else is irrelevant. All that matters is that they get what they want. Win, win or no deal is when the two parties agree to either find a solution that is beneficial to both of them or forego the entire deal. If a mutually beneficial agreement cannot be found, then the two parties sever ties. However, this is only applicable to new partnerships and relationships. Those who have been collaborating for a longer period may not find this to be a viable option. In these situations, reaching a compromise is ideal. 
Kavi explains these six dimensions in depth using many elaborative examples. Thinking win-win is the habit of interpersonal leadership. There are five dimensions of win-win. The first dimension is the character. It is the foundation of win-win, and everything else is built upon it. The three character traits essential to the win-win paradigm include integrity, maturity, and abundance mentality. The second dimension is relationships. Trust is essential in relationships, as it allows for openness and a willingness to understand each other even when we have differing opinions. The third dimension is the agreements. Performance agreements or partnership agreements are possible through the relationships defined. These agreements give definition and direction to win-win. The fourth dimension is the systems. Win, win can only survive in systems that support it. The fifth dimension is the processes. There is a four-step process that helps in achieving a principled negotiation. First, you need to understand the problem from the other person's point of view. Second, identify the key issues and concerns. Third, determine what results constitute a fully acceptable solution. Finally, identify the options that will help in achieving those results. Covey reiterates that win-win is not a personality technique, but a total paradigm of human interaction. He provides suggestions on how to integrate this paradigm into our interactions. Chapter 8. Habit 5. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Kavi begins the chapter by highlighting examples of people who fail to really understand what others are expressing. Instead, they offer solutions based on their own perceptions, completely overlooking the unique needs of the other person. He explains that we often have a tendency of rushing in to fix things, usually by offering good advice. By doing this, we fail to take the time needed to diagnose, that is, to deeply understand the problem first. Kavi maintains that seeking to first understand then to be understood is the key to effective interpersonal communication. Communication is the most important skill in life. However, while we spend years learning how to read, write, and speak, very few people have had any training in listening. For those who have been trained on how to listen, the focus has been largely on personality ethic, removed from the character and relationship basis. Effectiveness in the habit of interpersonal communication cannot be done based on technique alone. One has to build empathic listening skills, based on a character that inspires openness and trust. According to Kavi, seeking first to understand involves a deep paradigm shift. This is because many people do not listen to reply, but rather, they listen to reply. They are either speaking or mentally preparing to speak. We are filled with our own rightness, and our own autobiographies, that we seek to be understood. We never really get to understand what is going on within another person. Kavi outlines four levels that we usually listen at. The first involves completely ignoring the other person, not really listening at all. The second is pretending to listen. The third is selective hearing, where we hear only certain parts of the conversation. The fourth is attentive listening, where we focus our energy on the words that are being said. Kavi highlights that the fifth listening level is the highest form of listening, empathic listening. Empathic listening is not a skill. It is neither reflective nor active listening. Empathic listening involves getting the other person's frame of reference. It is listening with the intent to understand. This involves listening with the ears, eyes, and heart. This, Kavi maintains, is the key to making deposits in the emotional bank account. It is also deeply therapeutic and healing. He provides an example of an individual who secured a deal he had been after for so long, simply because he employed empathic listening. However, empathic listening is risky, Kavi explains, because it opens you up to be influenced. For this reason, deep listening takes a great deal of security. Habits 1, 2, and 3 provide the principal center, 
and this allows you to handle the more outwards vulnerability with peace and strength. He provides a personal example outlining the importance of diagnosing before prescribing. Seeking to first understand, he explains, is a correct principle that is evident in all areas of life. When we listen to autobiographically, we tend to respond in four ways. The first is evaluating, where we either agree or disagree with what the other person is saying. The second is probing, where we ask questions from our own frame of reference. The third is advising, where we give counsel to the other person based on our personal experiences. The fourth is interpreting, where we try to figure the other person out, trying to explain their motives and behaviors, based on our own motives and behaviors. Kavi explains these responses in detail, using an example of a conversation between a father and his son. While empathic listening is an important skill to develop, it should come from a sincere desire to understand. This will help others open up more since people are always looking for a chance to be understood. However, some argue that empathic listening takes too much time. This, Kavi says, is only true initially, but a lot of time is saved later on. This investment leads to greater returns especially when issues and problems arise, because of the high emotional bank account. By deeply listening to others, we are able to uncover the differences in our perceptions. The second part of habit 5 is seeking to be understood. Being able to clearly express ideas in the context of a deep understanding of other people's paradigms and perceptions greatly increase the credibility of said ideas. Understanding each other opens the door to creative solutions and third alternatives. Our differences then become the stepping stones to synergy. Kavi closes the chapter by providing suggestions on how to implement Habit 5 in a relationship. Chapter 9 Habit 6 Synergize Kavi states that synergy is the highest activity in all life when it is properly understood. It is the test and manifestation of all the other habits combined. He defines synergy as the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. He explains that the essence of synergy is to value differences. This is done by respecting the differences, building on strengths, and compensating for the weaknesses. Synergy is present everywhere in nature, and the existing challenge is applying the synergy learned from nature in our social interactions. Synergistic communication calls for you to open your mind and heart to the new possibilities, options, and alternatives. In this way, you get to fulfill habit too. With many people having been trained and scripted into defensive communications, they have never experienced even a moderate level of synergistic communication. This is a tragedy, as it means that so much potential has remained untapped. Kavi tells the story of his experience teaching a class, where the synergy experienced was so high that the class changed the course contents to flow with the synergistic experience. He states that his most memorable classroom experiences are those that had a synergistic experience. He also tells the story of the process his company took to create a mission statement for the business. The synergistic experience, once achieved, allowed greater participation, and led to the creation of a mission statement that will fit the business. He also expresses his role in facilitating the meeting between the executives of an insurance company. By helping them find a synergistic way to find solutions to pressing problems, the executives were able to become more flexible in their thoughts and proposals since they had stopped being defensive. Kavi tells the story of David Lilienthal using synergy to create openness between the scientists appointed to be part of the Atomic Energy Commission in the US after World War II. When he was chosen to head the commission, he spent time getting the scientists to know each other, and consequently, they were able to communicate with openness instead of resorting to defenses. The low level of communication occurs in low trust relationships, and the communication features defensiveness, protectiveness, and covering all the bases. 
In the middle position, the communication is respectful. Compromise occurs in interdependent relationships, but there is no synergy. This level of communication is a low form of win-win. Synergistic communication stems from high trust relationships that produce solutions that are better than what was originally proposed. The individuals genuinely enjoy the creative process. However, synergy is not achievable in some situations. Kavi tells the story of a husband and wife who have a dilemma. He explores the three levels of communication to showcase the outcome of each communication approach. He highlights that a high emotional bank account, thinking win-win, and seeking first to understand create the ideal environment for synergistic communication to occur. This creates a third alternative that may not be clear if the two parties are on opposing sides. Seeking a third alternative requires a major paradigm shift, but it produces powerful results. Kavi states that the key to interpersonal synergy is intrapersonal synergy. Dependent people and insecure people create negative synergy, which is more detrimental. Without intrapersonal synergy, that is, being truly principle-centered and integrated, then synergy is not possible. Synergistic communication requires developing the first three habits in order to develop enough internal security to handle the risks of vulnerability. He gives an example of a couple where the man was operating from his left brain, logical thinking, while the woman was operating from the right brain, creative thinking. The couple would have disagreements, and Kavi reminded them of a previous instance where they valued their differences. He expresses that the essence of synergy is valuing the differences between people. These include mental, emotional, and psychological differences. While it's not logical for two people to disagree and both be right, it is psychological. We interpret things differently because we were conditioned differently. Valuing another person's perception is a sign that you want to understand the person. He explains this using the fable of the animal school by Dr. R. H. Reeves. He outlines the concept of force field analysis, which is a model that was developed by Kurt Lewin. This model calls for the increment of driving forces, and the decrement of limiting forces if success is to be achieved. He explains that synergy is a great tool that can transform limiting forces into driving forces. He provides the story of a business that was in conflict with a bank, and how synergy was able to transform the relationship for the mutual benefit of both parties. He explains that all of nature is synergistic and that we should seek to apply synergy in all areas of our lives. He explains that if we only see two alternatives, we should look for a synergistic third alternative. He ends the chapter by providing suggestions on how to apply synergy. Part 4 of the 7 Habits of Highly Effective People – Powerful Lessons in Personal Change Renewal consists of the 7th habit. Sharpen the Saw – Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal The last chapter of Part 4 is Inside Out Again. Chapter 10 – Habit 7 – Sharpen the Saw – Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal Kavi gives an example of a man who refuses to take a moment to sharpen the saw because they are sawing down a tree. This introduces the concept of taking time to sharpen the saw. He explains that this habit surrounds all the others because it is the one that makes them possible. Sharpening the saw is about personal PC and it involves preserving and enhancing yourself because you are the greatest asset. This habit involves the renewal of the four dimensions of your nature, which include mental, physical, spiritual, and social, emotional. He explains that while different words are sometimes used in different philosophies, they all deal with the four dimensions, either implicitly or explicitly. He outlines examples of the different philosophies, citing Herb Shefford, George Sheeran, and the sound motivation and organization theory. He defines sharpening the saw as exercising the four dimensions of our nature regularly and consistently. This requires proactivity and it is a quadrant two activity.
The physical dimension involves caring for the physical body by eating the right foods, getting sufficient rest and relaxation, and exercising on a regular basis. He explains that thinking we do not have time for regular exercise is a distorted paradigm. He explains what a good exercise program is, as well as to what extent we should aim to raise our heart rates during exercise. He outlines the benefits of stretching as well as strength training. Kavi then tells a story about a time he spent at the gym with a friend. The friend explained that the benefit of the exercise is gained at the end. To gain strength, the muscle fibers have to rupture and then as the body overcompensates, the muscle is made stronger within 48 hours. Kavi was able to see that this applies even with emotional muscles. He gives the example of patience. If it pushed past the limit, nature overcompensates and patience becomes stronger. The spiritual dimension is your core, center, and your commitment to your value system. Spiritual renewal is done very differently by different people. Kavi undertakes daily prayerful meditation on the scriptures. He explains that great literature or music can provide spiritual renewal for some. He tells the story of Arthur Gordon, who described an unusual treatment he was given by his doctor. Spiritual renewal is a quadrant two activity, and it should not be neglected. He quotes Martin Luther, David O. Mackay, and a Far Eastern Zen master in a bit to explain the importance of renewing the spiritual dimension. When it comes to the mental dimension, the greater part of our mental discipline is derived through formal education. However, beyond formal education, many let their minds atrophy. So much time is spent on watching television, which can influence us in powerful and yet imperceptible ways. Habit 3 helps in choosing television programs that are inspiring, informing, and entertaining, which are best suited to serve and express your purpose and value. He provides a personal example of how watching TV is limited in his household. Education is vital to mental renewal, and this is not limited to systemized study programs. Proactive people find ways to learn, and reading great literature is a great way of renewing the mental dimension. Writing is also another great way of sharpening the mental saw, and journals can be a great way of expressing thoughts clearly and contextually. Writing good letters is also a good way of increasing our ability to think clearly, reason accurately and therefore to be understood effectively. Kavi calls sharpening the saw on the physical, mental, and spiritual dimensions, daily private victory. He recommends taking an hour to indulge in the same, and observe the value brought to your life. The social, emotional dimension renewal is focused on interpersonal relationships and habits 4, 5, and 6. He gives brief examples to showcase how this dimension is expressed through each of the habits. However, success relies on our personal security, which comes from accurate paradigms and correct principles. Intrinsic security is also derived from effective interdependent living, and from serving. Victor Frankl, George Bernard Shaw, and N. Eldon Tanner express the importance of being of service to others. Kavi outlines the quotes by Shaw and Tanner. Most people are scripted by the perceptions and paradigms of those around them. By reflecting back to others a distorted vision of themselves, they become a manifestation of what we see. However, reflecting back a clear, undistorted image may affirm their proactive nature and we treat them as responsible people. We can script them as worthwhile, independent, value-based, principle-centered individuals. With the abundance mentality, we are able to understand that positively reflecting others does not diminish us. He outlines the musical man of La Mancha to show how powerful re-scripting others can be. He also uses the example of a faulty school program that showed how powerful scripting is, even if it is distorted and wrong. The self-renewal process must include a balance in all four dimensions. Failure to renew one dimension negatively impacts the rest. 
He provides an example of organizations that focus on some dimensions and neglect others. He explains that balanced renewal is synergistic, and positively impacting one diamond sign also leads to positive impacts in other dimensions. He outlines this domino effect for every habit and every dimension. Daily private victory is a foundation of the daily public victory. Intrinsic security is fundamental when you need to sharpen the saw in the social, emotional dimension. He concludes by explaining that the renewal principle and process empowers us to move towards an upward spiral of growth and change, and continuous improvement. This requires learning, committing, and doing on higher planes. Chapter 11. Inside Out Again. In this chapter, Kavi outlines.